start recording okay so we're here with Julia Haskell developer so you 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 started the implicit CAD project right so you're the founder I did of that. not actually I inherited it oh you inherited it okay it was something that somebody set up and then they wandered off to do artificial intelligence research okay okay so do you now just back to implicit CAD so do you recommend that over open SCAD like any time or it depends on the use case Okay. I use it for everything, uh -huh. but I'm designing things in more of a C style. When you're working with implicit CAD versus open SCAD, uh -huh. open SCAD has a tendency to, uh, from a linguistic perspective, they they ornament their language. Okay. So, like, they'll add a feature by just kind of adding the feature, not adding the subcomponents of the feature. So you'll end up with something like uh, open SCAD. You have fonts, for instance. So you can just load a form from a file and use it, but you can't read a file. Okay. So all these strange limits because of how they've because of how they've uh, ornamented things. And me, I think of things a bit more from a functional programming C programming perspective. I've been a C programmer forever, so okay. from a C programming perspective, it means that you know it's got a C-like syntax. And the functions are, or the components of the language are smaller, but more powerful, if you will. Okay. How does this relate to PyOpenSCAD? So Luke loves that. Um, what's the relationship there? Um, actually, I don't know. I've never even played with PyOpenSCAD. Okay. I'm aware of a Ruby OpenSCAD derivative, okay. but not a Python one. Yeah, because uh, Luke raves about the object-oriented programming nature once you do the Py part. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I haven't, I mean, I've done, I, I pulled off some nice designs off OpenSCAD because there's a lot of libraries out there, but that's my only experience, just minimal contact with um, OpenSCAD. But in any case, so let's talk about the, the Steam Camp curriculum. So you s said you yeah. took a look at it. So what what do you think about, what, what, do, what do you think you could add to that? Um, so are you familiar with my work with uh, microwave aluminum casting? No. <laughs> no, that's not. Yeah. Sounds... <laughs> um, so. Five years ago now, wow. I uh, gave a talk at 31C3 on using... Tell people what that is for... Tell people what C3 is. Oh, yeah. 31C3. So uh, the C3 series of conferences is the Chaos Communications Congress yeah. here in Germany. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's kind of a very large hacker conference. And I mean hacker in the you know ethical sense. Mm -hmm. So everyone there has a very strong sense of whatever their particular morality is, and they're yeah. all trying to improve the world. Yeah. Sounds so good. I got to go to that. I've never been. I heard. I mean, CCC is the Chaos Computer Club is like mm -hmm. the oldest hackerspace in the world, or um, the oldest hackerspace is here in Berlin. It is the uh, it is CBase. Okay. All right. Okay. They throw a very nice New Year's party. Okay. <laughs> Cool. Well, I uh, got to visit it next year, but go ahead on uh, the aluminum stuff. So about five years ago now at 31C3, the 31st gathering of the Chaos Computer Club, yep. there was a, uh, I gave a hour long presentation on microwave aluminum casting, which mm. is essentially taking all the things that we use propane for and swapping them out for microwaves. And does it work that well or is um, it really? It works fairly. Fairly. The technology is getting better. Mm -hmm. There's actually some new stuff from, boy, I'm going to butcher their name because I always see it on the screen. It's not Amphenol because Amphenol is the con connector company, but there's a uh, company that is now producing solid state microwave transceivers uh -huh. instead, of the, uh, instead of basically the vacuum tubes we have been using, okay. which lets you do things like... Uh, let you do better targeting and also let you pick your frequencies better, prevents hot spots in the chamber, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's really going to push what I was working on to the point of being, you know, practical, everyday, usable. Wow. So is a regular microwave, I mean, what kind of technology does that use? What's, what's um, it uses basically a very strange vacuum tube set up to kick out microwaves in a rough sort of range of frequencies. Mm -hmm. So after where the vacuum tubes. Thing, 
Hmm? Actual vacuum tubes, th those are still Actual in vacuum tubes. Okay, okay. So the solid state technique is probably going to give us, well, right now, they say that with the solid state, they're using it for food cooking, of course. They, they're mm -hmm. thinking microwaves is in microwaves. Yeah. And they're saying they can do things like, you know, microwave a steak on the same plate as a thing of ice cream and keep the ice cream frozen. Or do mm -hmm. things like microwave an egg inside of the shell. Eggs will explode if you use a current microwave technique with it. So it has a lot better uh, potential when it comes to preventing hot spots and getting things nice and consistently warm. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, I seem to have lost your audio. I'm, I'm still here. Uh, is it my end? Is it your uh, end? Let's... It doesn't look like it's my end. Man, let's see this. See, is this any better? Yes, it is. Uh, I switched to Firefox. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what's going on. My Chrome, I'm on my, on uh, Linux. Uh, that's I'm Ubuntu 1604. I don't know. My Chromium has just been cutting the voice off on uh, Jitsi. Okay, but go ahead. So yeah, there's a new. Oh wow, that's a nice echo. Uh, okay, I'll turn you down for a moment. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so actually these are 3D printed. They're from Chris uh, from 3D Central. So these oh, are, nice. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, go ahead, but go ahead. So, yeah, there's a, there's a new integrated chip that I'm looking at that uh, Looks like it'll bring that technology to a bit more than just rigged demo status. Wow. I was able to do things like, you know, your standard let's melt aluminum in a microwave using, you know, using a small kiln and a little uh, a little steel cup and using uh, it's silicon carbide as a microwave inducting component. So the silicon carbide is actually what absorbs the microwaves and retransmits them back out. So basically making a kiln inside of the microwave, coating it inside the chamber with silicon carbide, then putting a cup, just literally a $2 cup that I picked up down at a thrift store, in the middle of that, filling it with aluminum pieces. And a metal yeah. cup. Yes, a very nice steel metal cup with no aluminum rivets. Had to be careful about that. Mm -hmm. And that, that technique works with any microwave right now, or no? Yes, actually, it does. Huh. Do you have a video? I, Can you show me a video or anything like that? Or? Um, I don't have, I don't think I have a video right now. It's been a little while. And obviously, I've moved yeah. several times since then. Mm -hmm. But there is a, the entire presentation was recorded. So you should probably go watch it. CCC 31. 31. Just look for aluminum and, yeah, microwaves. And I pretty much am the first link. Let me see. Let me see if that comes up. Uh, well, so what are the drawbacks? I mean, does it work? Is it just that it's difficult to create that structure, or like once you have it, it's really good? Well, here's your here's your drawbacks. Your first drawback is you end up with multiple microwaves, and the microwaves have a tendency to burn out. There's a lot of reflection still going on. Uh, wow. Okay, I lost video this time, not audio. Well, at least it is that. Can you see so me I, went through, I went through five microwaves during my experimenting, oh. okay. and one of them I managed to uh, blow a hole in about the size of your fist. Mm. Wow. Okay. 
So consumer microwave technology is a thing, and it can be rigged to work, but for aluminum casting, or for, for actually taking aluminum and melting it down into a crucible full of liquid aluminum, it's still not quite there. Mm -hmm. It can be rigged, but it's not quite uh, optimal. Where it is optimal, however, is whenever you're doing your molds, you know, of course, you have to set up a mold, and you have to you know, cook out your mold and all of that. But a microwave is a machine for cooking, you know, cooking the water out of things. Mm. Mold, you have to have set around, and then you have to cook them out. So I was able to, with a molding technique, turn around, and with microwaves, go to about three hours from 3D printed part to mold ready for aluminum to be dropped in. Three hours? Yeah. That sounds and you pretty can't even you can't even get them dry. I mean, you're literally putting a half wet mold in the microwave. So this works, works. So it works really to dry it out really quite quickly. Yes, it does. It works to dry them really quickly. As a matter of fact, it works to dry them a bit too quickly. Um, you probably are best off drilling a hole in the bottom of the microwave because otherwise your microwave will flood. Oh yeah. The water you know, tries to just seep out of the object and you just put a giant thing of water in the microwave. Mm -hmm. It will flood your microwave and kill your electronics if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. I see. So have you done a bunch of that to, and then how do you melt the aluminum? Um, I have done that and I've also done the aluminum in the, you know, small forbs the size of a milk crate kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So use that to get your aluminum molten, use the microwave to get your molds actually in good enough shape, and add one plus two. Hmm. Do you see this being, a, how practical do you see this being like for, for common, like say we're into production, like actually like producing things in an open source world of tomorrow. Do you see this fitting there? I do. As a matter of fact, I see the microwaves being the full technique being what fits there. Like I said, the new chips are quite exciting. The problems I was having with the, with the kiln inside of the microwave method eventually ended up being the microwave not quite evenly distributing all the microwaves and causing a hot spot and blowing, you know, causing a section of my kiln to get too hot and start to cook. And once something becomes pseudo-liquid inside the microwave, it becomes a thing that absorbs microwaves so you end up with a race condition in the side of your kiln and there's really nothing you can do to avoid it mm -hmm. it worked but without the without the newer technique it's not going to scale well mm -hmm. and with the new technique can you access is that doable how much development time would it take to to get that to a working device um i don't see more than a month's worth of dev time honestly it's i mean you just install it in a microwave they're building microwaves out of this for the next generation of, you know, smart home, et cetera, et cetera. So here in five years, we'll just be able to go pick them up off the side of the street corner because that's the way things work. How do how much does the chip cost right now, or how how big is this device? It's uh... um, it's actually smaller than the magnetrons that we currently use. Mm -hmm. So a magnetron usually is about you know the size of your fist. Mm -hmm. And these are just, you know, they're radio systems. So a third of that size. Well, and how much? How much are these? Um, they're $48 for the chip. What's it called? A, a solid state microwave chip? Uh, yeah, I'm, tr I'm blanking on the name. It starts with AMP, but it's not Amphenol. It's uh, Amplion. Yeah, I think that's it. A M P L E O N. They have a solid state thing that they're producing that is a 250 watt microwave amplifier. Microwave amplifier. Um. So they can do things like vary the frequency. And of course, varying the position of where microwaves actually, you know, where microwaves are causing heat by using two of these and kind of changing the phase, you can cho choose where in the microwave you're actually distributing the power. 
And that's one thing that the uh, traditional approach can't let you do. It has just one emitter in just one spot. And that becomes issues. Yeah. Let's see. Do you have a link or anything for the actual part I could buy? Um, DigiKey has it. One moment. Let me... Uh, okay, my oh. system will probably... So you, you get it? Uh, yeah, let me see. No, I don't see the link. And did you type it in the chat box? Sure. Let me uh, get one here real quick. Hey, I did get that name right. It is Amphion. see you again yeah just restart there's the actual part now let me get a ldmos Key has it straight up. Ninety three in stock. Uh, they're showing seventy, but I've seen it in places for as low as forty eight. I think it was earlier today. I'll send that link. Uh, so you got you got a digi key. There you okay. go. There it is. Okay, okay. So yeah, those are the parts. What do you need on top of that? So you need a power supply of some sort. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think it is 30 volts, but it wants it at like 16 amps. So it's kind of a ridiculous supply. They're claiming, I think it is 62% energy efficiency. Is it on and off, or do you control frequency with... Uh, so is there two inputs, just power, and that's it, or what else is there? Oh, uh, well, there's power, and there's an original low... There's an original signal. I mean, it is an amplifier. It is not just a uh, device to put out a thing. So you feed it basically the equivalent of a Wi-Fi card, mm -hmm. and it will give you the equivalent of a Wi-Fi card that will cook food. <laughs> I see. Okay. There, there are groups of hams who are using this not for the uh, not for the massive amount of power sense, but just in the the cleanness of the part at a higher wattage than what they're used to using. So they get a much higher signal to noise ratio out of it, even mm -hmm. though they're obviously not running it at full 250 watts. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, very nice. So, um, tell me more. Yeah, I bet you didn't expect this phone call. <laughs> Say it again? I bet you didn't expect this phone call. <laughs> no. Um, that's cool. Is that a, what, what else do you think about the, the curriculum there? Um, 
I like the approach. It seems to be very top down. Um, having a printer, having the entire package of software, having the entire, I mean, you're using, a, of course, you're using OpenSCAD and Cura and Grumble Grumble, but hey, that's life. FreeCAD. No, we're using FreeCAD in our. Oh, okay. FreeCAD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something. Well, I don't understand. Sorry, say it again. A lot, a lot of people aren't, aren't, you know, ready to just jump into programmatic. Right. Design right, right. Yeah, I mean, we can teach somebody to get a three D printed part in hour, one hour in FreeCAD. I mean, from starting. Yeah, teaching them C syntax is uh, going yeah. to take the hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that's good. Um, do Do you have experience things like? I mean, so you've built you've built three D printers and stuff like um, that. Many. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell me more. So, tell me more. Um, what, what have you built? So you got you built some printers. What kind of other things you, have you designed or built and stuff? Like um, mostly for me, it becomes printers that print printers that print printers that print mm -hmm. printers, and it's all the way down and all the way up. The last one I built at uh, Hack DC was about the size of a pool table. Yeah. And also was a hundred watt laser cutter. Oh yeah. yeah. Using what a tube a carbon dioxide. Tube the length of the table. <laughs> so it was nice and convenient. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, did you get a good price on it? What, what was the overall cost it for that build? Was like five hundred dollars for the tube. Mm -hmm. The um, rest of the build that was more expensive, but what's the biggest part there? Is that the optics or all the balancing um, system, like fans and? Well, my biggest in this context. As in largest cost that adds up to on top of the five hundred. Um, the largest cost was the linear rails to go all the way across the bed. Do you think we can do? See, because uh, I built a laser sore when I went. I went out to visit Stefan. By the way, do you, do you know him by any chance? I don't. Okay. Do you know people like Jeff Mo from Lulzbot by any chance? Uh, yeah, I actually worked for him for uh, about six months or so. I'm no kidding. Uh, mm -hmm. Early days of Lulzbot or? Um, medium days of Lulzbot. He had a spot where one of his system administrators had uh, exited stage right, and oh, wow. I kind of uh, filled in the gap for him. Oh, you, you knew you feel like moving to Colorado, though. Uh huh. So I did it all remotely. Okay. Cool. Um, but you know what happened? Happened recently, right? Yeah. The uh, trust me, I've been watching that with uh, with my yeah. eyeballs just kind of glued open. Yeah, it's a, it's the most amazing thing. It just blows me away. Uh, what's the latest there? Um, the latest there is a new company has picked up and incorporated. We don't know that much about the company themselves. Mm -hmm. I in practice, I mean, this is the end of open source, right? I mean, for them, right? I mean, they're not... I well, it won't be the end of the product either way. There's just too many of us out there in the field building derivatives of this thing. You know, I've got a Lulzbot derivative I'm working on now that oh, is yeah? part of that. I'm having to rewrite every freaking wow. thing. Wow, so this is, uh, yeah, I got to credit Jeff for the immortality. I mean, this is not going to die. I mean, like, for example, Lulzbot mm -hmm. Cura, I mean, that is the most amazing piece of software. I mean, compared to the the window, whatever, like the original, I mean, mm -hmm. man, it's like on, on Linux, it's so much faster. I don't know what they're doing in original Cura, but, I mean, they, they did a great job, for example, on Lulzbot Cura, which we use in it huh that's but that's like yeah i'm actually job. building a uh i'm building a slicer now that's what i was working on before i took this call so, so you're, you're i'm developing a slicer uh, another slicer yeah yet another slicer well slicers are much needed like <laughs> well this one is going to be a little bit weird because the printer that i'm building the lulzbot derivative is not a three axis how many axes it's a five. Uh, what else you got there? You got rotary? I got two rotaries. Holy cow. <laughs> I got a constantly rotating bed and a partially rotating head. Okay. Well, well Luke and I were talking about um, printing tubes reinforced on like a lathe kind of a 3D printer. So this is. Like yeah, I've seen, the... I've seen a uh, picture of one. I don't know if it's the one that Luke's running or not. So you know about I that? Don't... Luke talked to you about that already? I've asked him for the definitions of what he's doing because right now he's having to write his own G code and well, okay. forget that. I'll just add it to what I'm doing. Wow. 
Um, very cool. It's actually, it should be, the algorithms should be very similar. Yeah. Wow. That's excellent. Excellent stuff. So yeah, I'm glad to hear that Lowell's bot is immortal, but unfortunately the company, I think you think the actual products, they're going to discontinue them and move into like the whatever bioprinting or other stuff or. Well, actually I'm hoping they move into bioprinting. They started with a bioprinting product, but I thought it was a bit hacked together. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, the, the mini bed mm -hmm. still on a bioprinting product. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then, what do you think is going to happen to like things like Lowe's Bot Cura? So, so is the community just going to pick it up and run with it? or? Um, I think that might be the thing that we lose. You think we're going to lose Lowe's Bot Cura? Yeah. There was just a ton of work put into Lowe's Bot's version of Cura to make sure that each of the models of printer would actually work out of the box. And just not a thing. There's nobody to step into that gap. And yeah, I'm not adding it to my plate. You can add it to yours. Mm -hmm. We might. We might have to because it's really good. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, do you think we can do the what you did with the laser? You think we can use the universal axis? Did you look? Did you uh, look up universal axis? You know, you I have not seen universal axis okay, yet. Let, let me take a look at. Let me uh, show you that. Uh, now, Luke mentioned. Uh, you have issues on in terms of being type like you, you've got you mentioned about um that. i've got a carpal tunnel related injury which is actually why i did all of my aluminum work i was effectively grounded from using a keyboard for six months mm -hmm. and when you can't type and you know you're generally a hackery sort of person you go well what can i do mm. and so i sat down and you know built the microwave aluminum stack mm -hmm. and uh how are you right now i mean is that are you able to do type well or it's an issue or... um, that is mostly solved i switched to using the uh, ergo doxy z with a dvorak format so as long as i you know follow appropriate ergonomic protocols, my monitors are all at eye height, that kind of stuff. I'm generally good to go. Okay. Ergo doc, I, I don't know what that, let me see. Oh my goodness, the Ergo doc's easy. E-R-G-O-D-O-X. Go get it, oh. go get it now. Really, yeah? Yeah. They're, it's got a uh, it, keyboard though, and not, so you have to do a little learning? Well, it, it is a, every key is reprogrammable. Uh-huh. And the key map is also the, oh, the wow. position is completely weird. And so that's really good for people who so-called don't have any issues on it. It just makes you much more comfortable and all that. It does. You know, it prevents you from developing these issues just by being able to keep your hands out instead of scrunched up. Oh. Because there's two keyboards, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I could see that. Yeah, like, cause, cause otherwise you like, you like this versus like, okay, kind of more natural. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let me send you the link, Universal Axis, because uh, I want to ask you if you think this. Uh, I do want to do the three D printer, and we want to do the a, a a laser cutter that's much much cheaper than like a. Uh, than a laser saw kind of a machine. Um, so take a look at this thing. So, so this is the system, the universal axis is what we build all the machines out of. So you can configure mm -hmm. it into any kind of orientation from the simple one, the D3D universal, which is just a three axis, kind of a, like the snap maker kind of deal. But Okay, let me, uh, let me start with a standard rant here. Almost every link on this page is to a Google Doc or to Facebook. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So almost every link on this page does not pull up my browser by standard. Oh, man. Um, okay, then go to the WebGL one. Yeah. Oh, okay, there we go. WebGL source. 3D content dot B. Let me pop that out oh, real like quick. That. Well, what do we do? Like... Um... If we want cloud editable, I mean, this is a practical question. If we want cloud editable docs, I mean, what do we do? And is there a good alternative? Or well, there's always a. Oh goodness, I'm blanking on the name of it. Etherpad. Not Etherdoc, but Etherdoc Lite. 
the light version of that is actually better than the full version. Mm -hmm. Etherpad light? Yeah, yeah. The light version of that is better. Mm -hmm. Nice 3D view. Standard so 8 mil stuff. Yeah, yeah. And what I mean, what about pictures? Like where you can embed pictures and stuff. I mean, it's it's like the the docs, of course, are so super convenient on that. And we're doing this huge incentive. Okay, so we're doing this just to fill you in. We're going to do this open source, 3D printed, professional grade cordless drill challenge on Hero X. I saw. Yeah. We're going to do that, and it's like, if you don't use Google Docs or tools, we, I mean, FreeCAD is legit, and we got the FreeCAD and Wikis is good. The only missing link there is the Google Docs. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to do besides that. If you have suggestions, I'm open to that. For, for where you can actually do design docs where you have diagrams as well as pictures embedded, and that makes it so convenient. And it's live editable, cloud editable. Well, yeah. <laughs> Okay, where did I lose you? You are officially lost. Oh, oh there you are. Okay, excellent. You still Although you're still frozen. Yeah, I still hear you. You're just a frozen picture. Oh, let me let me just refresh that so you can maybe see it again. Um, did that fix it again, or did it fix it? Yeah, it fixes it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's cool. So you, you've done a lot of different heads, tool heads on top of the the motion system. So you've done a laser. Did you do any routers and other things? I have not done any routers. I didn't figure on doing that much uh, removal. Mm -hmm. If you uh, look at my presentation, it is on my attempt to uh, 3D print a car. But I didn't get that far with it because I got, you know, I did the usual yak shaving thing and got lost in the tool stack. Mm -hmm. uh, was that with the big printer that you did in Hack? Hack that was the idea. Wow. Large printer, aluminum casting techniques. Start to get somewhere with it. But uh, at the end of the day, well, at the end of the day, there was just only so much me. <laughs> right. And then, um, so is this the kind of stuff you talk like, you know, Luke's uh, super light car that's this related? I have seen that. That's actually why uh, Luke reached back out to me. Interesting, because the, the thing, I introduced, thing I said to him, it's like, okay, let, look, there's carbon reinforced plastics. Why don't we do that and 3D print it in one piece with a larger printer? Because then whenever you have an accident, you have to reprint the whole car. Yeah. But if you got the plastic recycling infrastructure, then that's fine. Yeah, but the carbon fiber stuff is going to fight with your recycling infrastructure. Yeah. Um. I mean, yeah, go ahead, re-extrude all that. Say goodbye to your nozzles. Mm -hmm. Not only that, you're constantly going to end up with your fibers getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh, so the main reason there is repairability? Yep. I mean, why would you produce something if you can't fix it? I mean, this is open source ecology, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, what about modules mo modular parts so like uh, not, not down to the tubes not down to the tubes but but parts modularization makes some sense i can i can see a case for that because mm -hmm. you uh, otherwise you're talking about modularization at the level of each tube uh, yeah i i don't think you should go that low okay okay it, good, it's good. a question of you know what scale do you work at yeah i, think I was something resembling the standard automotive pattern of you know frame plates over it yeah 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 i mean clearly but just as far as just the frame yeah 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 i mean that you think we can do that in one piece or you wouldn't do that i wouldn't do that in one piece multiple pieces yeah. i would do that in, in sort of the similar fashion to the way that detroit has been working on it they worked on it for a long time and uh, what did they do um they've got you know effectively three pieces Okay. Front, middle, and back, right? Mm-hmm. Sounds and good. And I think that uh, I think I would do those and then hook them together. Okay, that's cool. Um, so today uh, the thought occurred to me. Okay, so in the summer of extreme design build, uh, did you see the that announcement? It's a. It's oh, a I saw the uh, I saw the drill challenge, but that was about it. Yeah. 
Uh, there's another one. Let me just uh, show you that one. I was tempted to enter the real challenge, but I would consider myself a little bit of a ringer. Why is that? I have way too many things to bring to the table. I would probably, you know, be discouraging others in the industry. Okay. I used to do that at the uh, University of Maryland had a, you know, hackathon for their students. They would just generally let anybody enter. Yeah. So I would just enter with a team of students and eventually it got a, I think it got disheartening for the actual students. But this, I think we're, we can leverage that kind of thing in this challenge because uh, the thing is, everything on Hero X is competitive, and so we're going to do the world's first collaborative challenge. It's like, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's everyone. The, the all the rules there are you cannot copy from others or like build upon others' work. Here, it's about explicitly about you upload and download. You get rewarded for collaboration. So I think if you have too many ideas, you seed them and. I think it can take care of itself because maybe it encourages more people to build upon it. It's not where you're you're going off in a corner and developing your thing. You're not competing with others. The whole goal is that you are collaborating. So, I mean, really unprecedented. Like, I, I just don't see it yeah. anywhere. That is certainly a thing. I mean, that is part of why I uh, stopped doing these sort of challenges is, yeah, I just would arrive with too much of too many tools in place. And when somebody new is sitting there going, I am going to start writing a program. It's like, I've been working on a program for a month and a half now, and I'm going to use this program to, you know, accomplish this particular challenge's goals, and you're just sunk. Mm -hmm. So kind yeah. of yeah. out of that so that the community could build itself. I think I'm somewhat following you, but I think that's a longer discussion. I'm um, not, not sure I follow you completely on that. Is it that you... Can you explain that? So you um, would... Yeah, I see that we as a community have a large problem going on, which is that there are not that many people at the, you know, beginning to middle of entering this kind of, you know, high grade hack all the things skill set. And when somebody who does the you know, I high grade hack all of the things all day, sits down and competes in any sort of a competition with those individuals, I think that it is disheartening them and preventing us from having another generation of this, you know, extremely high skilled people. So that are how do we bridge that? Um, well, the first thing I did was take myself off the table. Then the next thing I did was spend the next 10 years teaching in hackerspaces which is what i've been doing but what i mean if you have a so say you take the challenge what i mean can you not provide just incredible inspiration to like to others and, and so you're seeding ideas why would that be particularly discouraging if like so everybody's thrown stuff into the pool wouldn't that mm -hmm. somehow work or what, what do you i think that might work this is different than you know then the situations I think have been causing that problem to get worse. This okay. might be a situation that helps to make them better. Well, yeah, I mean, we want to, I mean, that's the thing we want to address. And I'm really glad to talk to you about that. <laughs> that's interesting. You, uh, you bring this up. That's uh, fascinating. But I mean, that's, that's what I consider the biggest problem that we have in a community. We don't have a lack of talent. We have a lack of scale. And well, what about... We're not going to get that scale if we, you know, are constantly undermining people who are just trying to enter the field. So you're saying that just because you're like just way overperforming over the rest, that simply just discourages others? It has to. I mean, how, tell, tell me more about time. that. Like, tell me, tell me some examples. Um, well, for instance, if anyone writes, wants to write software, and effectively, if I am in the same building, it'll end up on my plate one way or the other. It's a very bad problem, and you can even see it in a hyperspace. Every person, you know the effect of hmm. every person, every machine has a person you go to, because that person is hmm. the expert. And as a result, that person becomes the expert for that machine even more. Mm -hmm. So it's this constant feedback loop of people who want to get things done 
causing somebody else to be the person who has all the knowledge and all the real resources. I mean, is that a question of bad documentation and lack of teaching? I mean, lack of knowledge diffusion and transfer. That's, I mean, that's, it is. that's but, like part of the reason why we're doing these steam camps. We're saying, holy cow, I got this amazing, you know, I've been at this for a decade, hacking stuff and building real mm -hmm. things. It's like, holy cow, the way I've been transformed doing that, I simply need to share that. And, and I don't see a problem in sharing that. I mean, people are eating our stuff up. Well, good. Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I, uh, you know, I've spent probably 10,000 hours in a hackerspace doing exactly that. Just trying to show everybody every technique and every technology and doing everything I can to not be the one to do the thing, mm -hmm. whatever that thing is. And it didn't really work well. Um, or... It worked in some cases. There are definitely some people back at, you know, back at Hack DC or back at Free Geek Arkansas that did take the lesson to heart and have continued along the particular path, mm -hmm. but it didn't scale very well. And I'm still trying to solve that problem myself. Are you working on something specific right now regarding that or? Um, no, no, I'm just trying to figure out what the, uh, what the right approach is. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I have a good answer. As you've said, documentation is key. And, you know, we have this, this list that we use and we're trying to address it mm. but that doesn't mean that it gets all the way addressed because a lot of it is a uh, a lot of it becomes political or a lot of it becomes you know the architecture of the interfaces of the people that you have and it's a it's a big problem what's your uh, opinion of, of the whole fab lab stuff how does this play in I haven't seen Fab Lab stuff much in person. I've seen a little bit of Fab Lab stuff wander in and out of Free Geek Arkansas, but it wandered in and out after I was gone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, I keep in touch with the spaces I used to run, mm -hmm. and I did not see the, the work with Fab Lab really benefit them any. Yeah. yeah. I think it, you know, it kind of continued them but it didn't improve them if that makes sense um i'm sorry can you repeat that so you're saying that when, i'm saying that when people went to the fab lab courses or whatever it, it helped them a little bit but didn't really do much or is that what you're saying right it didn't do much there was not a you know there was not a qualitative difference in the people before and afterward they had a little bit more tools but it mm. didn't you know that exponential curve that you know they, they just didn't get it. It was a linear curve. It was a, a, a linear amount of improvement, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, it does. It does. What do you think is the missing part there? Can, can you put your finger on it? or? I don't think I really can. I wish I had an answer to that. Yeah, it's weird. Like, so, so the, you know, naturally the Fab Labs have all the people that can possibly teach our stuff, but nothing. It's like that's a bad place to go to to find instructors for some reason. It's weird. I don't get it. Part of it, I think, it may be the idea that they're, I would say it's lack of entrepreneurial spirit there in the sense that um, a lot of the labs are just funded by some welfare state organizations. <laughs> Pardon my language there. So uh, I don't think they have, they're kind of hungry to also to do the, as far as the real world impact where it's not about oh look at my special project it's it's more like oh look what you can do yourself it's not i don't see the collaborative aspect there emphasized in any any tangible way from what i've seen luckily that's that's something that i've managed to get the crews at both of my previous bases to at least do somewhat that's why i'm saying there's been you know there's been somewhat of an advance there and that the thing that i usually push for people to do is anything that improves the state of really the state of the art in the industry. If you can get them to the point where they're actually changing the way the world works instead of just building things for themselves mm -hmm. or keep space running, I mean, even the smallest five line patch to the smallest thing, I think is more productive as far as getting people to that than look, I can print a thing. In other words, 
oh, okay, look, I just did this. I kind of gratified myself, but I didn't push the state of art at all, right? Right. Yeah. You've got to, unless you can get somebody to the point at which they can, you know, even with all the assistance that you can possibly give them, mm -hmm. don't get it wrong. It's not like, you know, you can yeah, yeah. teach somebody to contribute to the Linux kernel, but you can stand behind them and give them all the help to where they can get across that particular line. I think that's the important part. Let me ask you this. What about some really practical projects like this house that I'm sitting in? It's the CD Home. It's, a, it's an open source design, modular design that we're going to print panels for with larger printers next year's summer. So I think the, the missing link is that we get people to the very tangible material goods that are out there. That, that's what we're doing. That's, that's our approach mm -hmm. to it. But I'd love to have you involved in there since you're an ultimate hacker. Uh, I try. Do you think, um, so our next, our schedule for the next one, so we got the January thing, next one's going to be two months away from that. Do you think, uh, can we get you to be an instructor in that? I think that's a doable thing. I don't think that the January one is. I've actually even got another conference that I'm going to. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. And I, I mean, you looked at our curriculum there. It's like, yeah, you can handle that and more, right? I mean, I, I don't think yeah. that'd be. That's a that's an average night at the hacker space. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, I mean, obviously, you wouldn't get through the whole thing, but you would probably touch on one or two of the items there and be teaching exactly that, you know, material. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, have you done stuff with plotters? Um, just a little bit, not much. Mm -hmm. Do you know how to do like? Uh, Inkscape I mean, or whatever tool change to get the pictures into the G code like that. Sure, sure, I do, but uh, I've typically avoided anything that has any sort of a graphical interface, like at all. If that's the like, case, uh, would you be able to handle the stuff that we do with, which has a lot of graphical interfaces? Um, yes, I would, but I would definitely be looking for the non-graphical versions of each particular type of tool. Right, but how do we teach? I mean, if we want to make access to to normal people, average people. Um, no, that's part of why the implicit cat site ended up with a website, but I do, uh, it was a uh, bad attempt to solve that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, if... if like, uh, Haskell is really hard to compile, really hard to get shit installed, get, get your machine working. So I put it all on a website. Mm -hmm. You can actually use the website as your own rendering engine. And that was my, you know, first attempt to solve this kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. You're right. People need these sort of graphical tools so that they can, you know, so they can really quickly connect with how the data works without having to run it through the back of their head. Mm -hmm. I've just typically not found that as a useful practice for myself. Right, right. But if, if, if you... And, and what? For yourself and what? You end up losing the parametrics when you do those sort of things. Most of these tools, they're not built for, I have a directory full of files and they're all related to each other and I want things for this to go here and things for that to go there. They're a tool for making a thing. Right. Now, if that's what we do at this time to make public access more reachable, are you willing to teach that if, you know, all the sure. tools that we Sure, that do? makes sense. Okay. Yeah. No, it's interesting. <laughs> uh, like, because I'm... Um, you know, like what you're talking about, I mean, it's sophisticated, technical. Um, so for me, it's actually a surprise that some people like yourself find that easier. But but let me ask you this. Do you think, for example, <laughs> like I think I could, I could probably design something faster, way faster than you can by hand in FreeCAD. Do you think or no? Or yeah, probably. So, I mean, you appreciate that there's some speed advantages there too, right? I mean... There are speed advantages, but the thing that the thing that becomes important to me is the interface of the parts. You can design something quickly in FreeCAD, mm. and you'll get it out the door. Mm -hmm. And that'll work fine for a part. That'll work fine for five parts. When you start getting up into 50 parts, and they're all interconnected, and they all have a, par a parameter, and they all have to interface with each other, you're going to start running into issues that, mm -hmm. you know, these these other stacks are going to address automatically. Mm. So, so it's, just, yeah. it's just an optimization question. So it's a matter of complexity. So would you say that like the most advanced products, are they designed more with the high level tools, like not like 
whatever uh, SolidWorks or whatever, but the, the highest highest level, like the most complex design spaceships, most advanced cars, they don't use the graphical interfaces a lot, or do they? Um, I think they do, but I think they're using more advanced ones that also have the parametric functions in them. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, as a community, mm -hmm. the two halves are not yet meeting. Yeah, but I mean, like Freakout is such a, I think, such a cool band because it's completely based. I mean, you can do open SCAD stuff in there. I mean, it's completely parametric, so I, I think that's mm -hmm. a lot of that is all, it's all in there, and it's on Python, so you can completely extend it and add features to it. Um, yeah, cool. Um, all right. So, where do we go from here? I have no idea. This is a you question. <laughs> What's your schedule like these days? Are you really busy with your current work, or? Yeah, I've got my you know usual forty hours a week. Plus, um, other than that, I really don't do that much else. I have explicitly avoided running a hackerspace while I'm in Germany, in part because I don't want to be that you know, I don't want to be that pardon my French, American asshole that shows up and says, I know English and only English, and I am going to speak it here, and you are going to speak my language, or you're not going to be able to do things in this space. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be that cultural appropriation sort of, you know, individual. So I'll avoid a space while I'm here and while I'm still learning my German. <laughs> okay, yeah, that sounds good. Well, yeah, maybe we can... Uh... See how we can get you involved in the, in the next thing. So the first thing is actually to put a date on that. I'm doing one that's going to be in Hong Kong, and, but I'm not sure that's that's like a month away after this one. But after that, so we'll first put that's one. That's pretty far across the continent. <laughs> yeah, um, Hong Kong University. So they're inviting me there. But um, uh, let's talk about the the next one then after that and. We can we can pretty much refine like based on the outcome of this January one, we'll see how far mm -hmm. that takes us. But we'll learn from that and then uh, see where we go from there. But probably like like do build upon that content, but pretty much can this pr process. So the idea being that we get a number of these collaborating at the same time, so you get this mass collaborative process that yep. that actually ends up pushing the state of art. Like you say, I mean, we want to be able to teach that in some way because i think a lot of people can do that and like you said in a small ways like add five five lines of code or just make this thing that's simply missing right now add that um but yeah well and if you're if you're doing that with a large group of people then it makes up for the effect of those of us who have been doing this forever kind of just you know not being the one directly pushing the state of the art because if i've got you know, if I've got five people in my space and they're all pushing forward on something that's interesting, yeah. then that probably is more good in the world than me sitting at home writing code for five hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that may be a, a cool match for, you know, taking where you are and then uh, adding this other dimension. I mean, I think that, that could really work well together mm -hmm. uh, since you got the skill sets and then we got to just trans transfer that. It's a question of communicating that's and teaching. Right here. So. Sorry, what'd you say? That's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, let's keep in touch. And yeah, Luke and I will be scheming out more stuff with the car and stuff. I, I want to invite him to the. So I am inviting him to the summer of design, extreme design build. Is that something you'd be interested mm -hmm. in? Would you be able to take off a two weeks or a month to to teach in the summer? Um, my site? workplace would love it if I would. I haven't. Uh, you know, I have a typical American workaholic attitude, which has not necessarily uh, gelled well with with European 20 some odd days of vacation a year. I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> so um, you'd be into that. So can you do a month? 30 days? Um, I might be able, able to. to. I'd, I'd have, have to discuss, discuss it. With, with your, yeah. your people? Okay. Well, uh, did I send you that link? I, I think I put it in the chat, right? Um, yeah, 2020. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, if we have you there, uh, probably the... So we'll be doing things like large printers for, for doing things like rubber tracks and tires. So we, we're going to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, see literally. How, literally. See, I've see done that before. Yeah. I actually have the uh, rubber track injection molding system I built at the same time as I'm doing my aluminum work. Wow. Yeah, so I mean, 
Okay, so we should we should discuss further on that. Like, uh, so why don't you find out if you can do that? And I'd love to have you as an instructor. Then we can talk more about that. But if you are good to go, um, All right. But for two weeks, you'd definitely be able to do it, or yeah, that's doable. Okay, so okay, let's. Um, well, my my mind is kind of exploding on this right now, but that, that's pretty awesome. Um, because I'm trying to get Luke. I think Luke said he can commit to a month. Uh, out here as well um, mm -hmm. and we're paying four thousand a month i mean that's all we got uh in a budget right now is that is that okay with you or? Um, i think that's doable yeah 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 so yeah let's let's talk about yeah let, let's do that maybe you can find out and let's continue this discussion on on the summer x take a look at that and see what you think and if you have any feedback and uh, based on the pro, I mean, the program there right now is pretty much the rough sketch. But I mean, we, we have a lot of leeway in terms of what, what we're trying to do. But the part of it is that on one side, you put, you're put we're trying to get people to push the state of art, really pushing the limits of collaborative design. We're literally in like two hours of collaborative literary tra literacy training. You're actually able to start 3D printing using FreeCAD design and, and then prototyping from there. And then like basic tools, wikis, work logs, version histories constant uploads, real-time real, real -time collaborative, mm -hmm. rapid prototyping, all of that, uh, I think we can really show amazing things because we've learned a lot since the last time we ran that summer school in 2014. So uh, the schedule right now has, it's part experimental, but it's all, there's another track, actually an entrepreneurship track, where we're taking one of the most developed things and turning it into a product. So for the first month, it's going to be productizing the large printer. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have a... We're also working on a high temperature chamber. So you like your stuff. I mean, you probably knocked this out of the ballpark here, but we're doing a 178 C continuous build chamber. So, oh, so yeah, that that's, kinda... that's pretty simple. How would you do it? Um, usually your fire cement, but you, I also recommend perlite. Okay. But how do you do, how do you keep the components out of there? How do you keep the sensitive parts out of there? Hmm, let's see, you're doing motion in that system. Well, you can always do the magnetic approach. What's that? How's That's that? what they do in vacuum chamber systems. <laughs> Moving things through yeah. magnets? that are outside yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh that's that's a little above our pay grade but yeah no we've got a simple i'll i'll send you the link maybe you can comment on that what we have on that but anyway the the point was and the end of each month we have a. Uh, we pretty much release a product. The second month is going to, we're actually going to release our micro tractor. So like a 27 horsepower or so tractor. And, and then the, actually the torch table that goes with that because you got to have that to produce it. And in the, in the third month, we'll release the, the, the next iteration of the aquaponics system and some micro houses as stuff. Okay, here's it's packaged enough that you can actually replicate it. So crazy stuff. But we have a lot of leeway in terms of what how we can still re rearrange the schedule. So please take a look at that. Let me know what you think. All right. Excellent. I'll get the email. Thank you so much. So that would be great. Great to have you. No problem. Uh, Look okay. Thanks a lot right. for talking. We'll talk soon. Okay. No problem. Bye. Bye bye.